Hello everyone, my name is Andrea Fidler and I'm honored to be introducing our first plenary speaker of the morning. Dr. Rahel Briggs is the National Director of Healthy Steps, an evidence-based pediatric primary care program designed to improve the health, well-being, and school readiness of babies and young children in low-income families. She came to this role after a successful career at Montefiore Health System in New York, where she served as the founder and director of one of the nation's largest integrated pediatric behavioral health services. During her time at Montefiore, she grew Healthy Steps from one practice to 21 practices, reaching over 30,000 children each year. Dr. Briggs is currently an Associate Professor of Pediatric Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She completed her undergraduate work at Duke University, her doctoral work at New York University, and her internship and postdoctoral fellowship at Children's Hospital and Research Center at Oakland. Dr. Briggs is the recipient of the 2018 Healthcare Delivery Award from the Academic Pediatric Association. To date, she has received continuous grant funding since 2006 and has given over 70 invited presentations. During her talk today, she will discuss the use of biomarkers to measure the effects of exposure to toxic stress in infants and toddlers within the context of the Risk Stratified Healthy Steps program. Over the next hour, you will gain a better understanding of the rationale for a prevention focus in psychology, the Healthy Steps model, as well as the feasibility and purpose of using biomarkers to identify individual exposure to toxic stress. Without further ado, I'm excited to turn it over to Dr. Briggs for her presentation entitled, Bringing Precision Medicine to Prevention, Healthy Steps, Toxic Stress, and the HERO Program. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, Marissa. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. Yep. Great. Uh, I don't want to talk into the void for an hour. I'm thrilled to be with you all today and um, thrilled to talk about precision medicine. I think perhaps uh, more than any other time this week and the crisis that we're all living through right now has brought to light uh, the fact of privilege and the way that different circumstances affect each of us differently. When we think about the mental health and the development of our infants and toddlers, and indeed children overall, we know that these circumstances affect them differently. And I hope today to talk to you about the latest updates about bringing biomarker measurement to our already existing suite of assessment services to really understand which kids may benefit from which kind of services and when they've had enough. So uh, really excited to be with you here today. I want to um, thank you to SPAC leadership, to KU. I was invited to speak at a number of different conferences between you know, whenever this all started and you know, the end of the year. Every single one canceled or postponed indefinitely, except for this one. Every single one. And when I thought about that, I thought, well, no huge surprise. Pediatric psychologists by nature are people who aren't, um, aren't daunted by challenges. And so I just really want to highlight what an extraordinary effort it's been for everybody to put this on and glad to be here today. So thank you. We are going to start off your Friday uh, morning where you've had quite a week, I'm sure, talking about early childhood brain development 101, because what's more thrilling than that after your first cup of coffee? Um, we'll talk about toxic stress and the HERO program. We'll talk a little bit about Healthy Steps, which is a model to really address some of these issues and the evidence, policy, and finance behind Healthy Steps, and then how we think about growth and scale of all of these efforts. So with no further ado, get your coffee in hand, get your, uh, you know, your office mates, whether they're your cats, your dogs, your children, or other folks ready, and let's jump in. Uh, synaptogenesis, why not start there? Basically the idea that what we're really doing here is focusing on the connections between neurons. The more frequent communication between neurons, the stronger the connections. You can even think about it as almost a secure attachment between neurons, if you will. There is an unparalleled proliferation of neural connections that take place in this developing brain in the first couple years of life. It's not a firm like, oh, after age three, it's over. But I will say that Jack Shonkoff also often mentions that age three is middle age when it comes to brain development. 
So in these early years, a child's brain will make neural connections at a rate of about a million new connections per second, one million per second. And it's this idea of use it or lose it. So neural connections that are neural circuits, excuse me, that are used more frequently will be solidified or more secure. And then if you're not using it, those connections will either be less secure or they may not happen at all. So when, we, when you hear that infant brain development is described as plastic, this is what we're talking about. The brain is developing in relation to experiences. However, really critically, there's not a lot of filtering of those experiences. It's not like the brain is saying, well, let me just take in the good and let me push out the bad. It's taking it all in. That early childhood brain is like a sponge. It is always recording. It takes in the good and the bad. And so our real job is to limit the bad and enhance the good. So when a baby's born, you know that even though they're mostly head, right? And that's what helps a lot of the secure attachment happen. Their brain's about 25% mm, the size of what it will be as an adult. And as the brain develops, it's really developing from the inside out, if you will. It's developing from that brain stem and then developing upward and outward, meaning the areas of the brain, like the limbic system, which are just right above the brain stem, of course, are influenced and impacted much earlier by experiences than an area of the brain, say, like the, like the frontal lobe, which would be more prone to environmental stimuli or more impacted by our environmental stimuli when the child's several years old, right? If we were all in a room together, I'd be looking at your faces and saying, does that make sense? Does that not make sense? So just in case it's not totally making sense, I'll share with you a metaphor that I often use about this, that it's just like the house. You build the house from the ground up, right? And if you build that foundation of the house strong, then you're really going to have important important structures that are built on top of that and work well. They can withstand a storm, they can withstand a hurricane. And in the same way, they are influenced by everything on top of them. So I hope that makes sense. Um, back to this idea that the, the baby's brain is a sponge and takes in the good and the bad and isn't really differentiating between the two. We know that babies who have experienced significant trauma often have very real deficits in memory. In essence, they're struggling to remember what it is they've learned each day. Some people think about that in terms of an evolutionary perspective, that why try to remember trauma and fear better to forget. But really important to understand that this stuff is happening prenatally and absolutely from day one. The days of thinking about babies' brains as sort of blooming, buzzing worlds of confusion, um, <laughs> like, uh, like Henry James uh, talked about, are long over, right? So we all know this. I'm talking to folks who really know the difference between critical and sensitive periods, but just a reminder after a very long week that critical periods have distinct windows of time when they start and they stop. And after that time period ends, the window of opportunity for whatever that skill is to develop closes. Sensitive periods, on the other hand, really begin and end more gradually. They represent the optimal time for maximal change to happen, although you could change after that sensitive period ends, right? Think about language development, for an example. And we all know that it's much easier to learn Spanish when you're young versus when you become an adult trying to pick it up and after six months you're still struggling with hola, como estas, uh, but your two-year-old is off to the races. Pat Kuehl and some colleagues did some really fascinating research, and I'm showing that to you on the screen right now, where in essence they took Japanese infants and American infants, and at birth exposed them to all of the sounds in each other's alphabet, right? And at birth, those babies could distinguish between American alphabet sounds, Japanese alphabet sounds. She brought them back in at nine months old. And by that point, the Japanese infants had lost the ability to distinguish between the American R and L 
sounds that simply don't occur in Japanese spoken language. So just by nine months, this use it or lose it construct that we talked about, they had lost it. They had lost the ability to distinguish between those two sounds. Pretty fascinating and really early on. And this graph just tries to bring it all together when we look at development holistically and yet again illustrate the ways in which early brain development really becomes foundational, like the house. What you see here is a great quote again by Jack Shonkoff, who said as young children develop their early emotional experiences literally become embedded in the architecture of their brains. I've heard some people refer to them as emotional tattoos. It's a sponge. It's not filtering. It's taking it all in. So when you think about trauma in this often cited study, well, at least I cite it a lot, and I think others do as well, Barth and colleagues showed a pretty extraordinary relationship between early childhood adverse experiences and developmental delay. This is a sample of children who had all experienced either child abuse and or neglect. So each of them had at least one adverse childhood experience or risk factor. And then they looked at these kids at age three and they looked at whether or not they were likely to have a developmental delay. And if these children had seven adverse childhood experiences within the first three years of life, 100 percent of them had a developmental delay. This is extraordinary and it really underscores the importance of context. I think we all have stories like this, but when I worked as a healthy step specialist in the Bronx, I distinctly remember um, seeing a mom and a young baby on a Monday morning after what had been a beautiful weekend in New York where a lot of us were outside and I um, asked her, how was your weekend? And she said, it was okay. And I said, tell me what you guys were able to do. And she said, well, I'm in a new shelter and I don't care for the neighborhood. So we just stayed inside all day. And this was a 12-ish, little after 12 month old baby. And I thought to myself, wow, what an, what an important sense of context for this baby. We quickly mapped out some train routes to a nearby park that she felt comfortable with, but really just underscoring the incredible importance of context and individual difference. So that's what I want to get into next. So you've heard this HERO. What's HERO? It stands for Health's Early Relationship Origins. And it's a multi-site feasibility trial for now. Uh, efficacy soon, conducted in collaboration with the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, led by Jack Shankoff. It's a pretty extraordinary network, and I spoke about this a little bit at last year's SPAC, but I'm really excited to spend more time and just go a little bit deeper this year. Um, there are three groups of people participating in HERO. One are these wonderful developmental scientists. These are people like Megan Gunner and Pat Levitt and Chuck Nelson, um, Tom Boyce, people that are really at the you know, forefront of studying this, either in human models or animal models, and they are scientists with a capital S. Another is community leaders, and I'd say leaders in that with a capital L. These are folks, it's been, we've been meeting for years, and I can't think of a single community leader that's turned over. These folks have been with us since the beginning. There are people who either have lived experience in say the child welfare system, or the special education system or the mental health system and have been chosen by their peers to represent their community. Because you can imagine when we talk about things like biological markers, you very quickly get into very difficult and very important discussions about equity, about historical injustice that has been um, conducted in the name of science. So this has been an absolutely key piece of this work. And then finally, primary care practices. And that's where we've come in and that's where Healthy Steps have come in. We are working collaboratively. We are talking about the goal of preventing disease and impairment due to toxic stress. Um, last year, we were just in the middle of phase two. And now I'm excited to bring you up to speed on phase three as well. So the key objectives of HERO are to develop a biomarker panel to identify evidence of toxic stress effects on brain and physical development in young children. 
everybody knows this term toxic stress, right? And it's one of those things where it's sort of um, been so successful that now it's suddenly like, okay, wait, but how do you measure toxic stress? So toxic stress we define as chronic, unrelenting stress, unmitigated by, by a primary caregiver, again, brain development in context of relationships. How do you measure toxic stress? How do you measure if a kid's been exposed to toxic stress? How do you measure how much of that toxic stress has been, that kid's been exposed to? How do you measure if what's a toxic stress to me is a toxic stress to you, right? And that's what we're working for here. A key objective here is first developing this biomarker panel. Then really being able to identify children at risk at the individual level. So what do I mean by that? Um, if any of you are a parent with two or more children, I probably don't need to say much about how children differ. If you are a sibling, children differ. The bottom line, we each come into this world with our own temperament, yes, and that's long been studied in the field of psychology, but perhaps beyond this, our own predisposition to risk, to stress, to environmental challenge, which is pretty extraordinary. And then finally, the panel could be used as an outcome measure to assess if an intervention like Healthy Steps or any other intervention is effective. And of course, it has to be able to actually be used in the primary care setting. We're not interested in something that works out there in some other world. We need it to work in primary care and really be feasible at scale. So that is HERO in a nutshell. This slide is probably hard to see, but suffice it to say, there are folks from all over the country um, actually, even into Canada, uh, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Midwest, the South, so all over in terms of the practices, the community folks, um, and the scientists. So phase one, just as a reminder, we had four test sites in Texas, New York, Massachusetts, and New Mexico. This all started in late 2017, early 2018, and then finished in late 2018. And you see the number of participants. You see that we were collecting urine, saliva, buccal cells that come from the cheek, hair, and blood. You'll see that the blood numbers are quite low. The urine numbers are pretty low. And the hair really varies. And if you know anything about the racial and ethnic makeup of some of these places, you might be starting to think about that already. The blood is only ordered if the kid needs blood already. So maybe it's a 12 month visit and there's a lead screen or there's some other reason to draw blood. Then we will ask for blood as well for this, but th these kids are not getting a blood stick just for this. And urine, of course, um, you can't make a baby pee. <laughs> and so it was pretty difficult sometimes to collect that urine. And hair, there are lots of cultures for whom taking any hair from a child's head before age one is just not going to happen. And then cultures for whom hair remains very culturally bound and very important throughout life. And so really thinking about that. Phase two, we dropped the urine. It was just too hard to collect. We couldn't figure out a way to do it. And so urine has been dropped, but otherwise everything remained. And you can see that data is either ongoing or has ended in some folks. This is updated as of January of this month, but really importantly in phase two, we tested whether or not you could do a, two, a pre and a post. Well, that, no, that's not the right way to say it, sorry. Just a time one and a time two. There's no intervention necessarily in between. But could you test a child, say, at six months, and then test that same child again at 12 months? And really what you're testing there is, is it feasible and is it acceptable to parents? Will they do it again? And exciting to say that we showed that, yes, it does seem to be pretty feasible that we were able to get, you know, in Cambridge, for example, who are the ones that are finished, 50 started, 50 finished. So phase three, so exciting, so thrilling, so super exciting. The group feels like this biomarker assay or this panel is reliable. It's feasible within primary care. And so now it's about taking it to scale with 6,000 new participants. So if you saw the numbers on those other slides, it was like 50 here, 50 there. Now we're talking 6,000. 
These participants will be primar primarily recruited from Healthy Steps sites and from pediatric practices that are partnering with Help Me Grow. We will also be introducing some machine learning techniques. I know that sounds like, wait, what? But it's things like eye tracking and other mechanisms that you can really spread across a large sample to identify kids that are exhibiting excessive stress activations and the development of a comprehensive index risk score. If you haven't been able to pay too much attention and your kid's been talking in the background and the dog is barking, let me focus us all for just one second. A comprehensive index risk score is a game changer. It becomes our A1C, our systolic and diastolic blood pressure. For everyone who doesn't think that early childhood brain development matters, and I know that's not you guys, but other people, but for all those people, this becomes a number. And it's not a number that exists independent of all of our clinical observations and the important feedback from families, but it becomes a number that is based in biology where we can talk about excessive stress activation in infancy. So like thrilling beyond belief. So here was some early pilot data from 2017 from Pat Levitt's lab. And so what it was showing is that when a family experiences more stress along the bottom axis, there is lower electrical activity in the brains of infants. And these infants are two months old. So it took nine months for those Japanese infants to lose the ability to use that RNL sound. These infants are two months old and you're already seeing an impact in their brain activity as per EEG based on stress in the family's life. In a moment like right now when those amongst us who are least fortunate are ex experiencing dramatic stress, this is really critical to pay attention to. And I think a lot of times if you have a family with a two month old and a five year old and a 10 year old, and we think about, well, how stressful is this for that family? The 10 month old, the 10 year old is gonna tell you about it. The five year old might be telling you about it. Both of them are gonna have behaviors that change. The two month old is obviously not telling you about it, but might not even look any different. And you think to yourself, oh, well, they'll just a baby, they'll be fine. Because of that brain plasticity in these early years, because of that sponge, look how impactful this is just at two months old. Data from that same set from Pat Levitt said in 2017 showed that isoprostanes in the urine could also be measured as an index of stress activation. So babies with more isoprostanes at the two month mark had slower growth and electrical power. So again, showing lower EEG power based on reported stress from parents and based on proteins in the urine, right? So those were 2017 data. And just at the end of 2019, some of those data were confirmed and published in JAMA Pediatrics. I'm not going to, you know, go through this in too much detail, except to say to you that this was a, this was a, a sample from across the country. Um, there were a good chunk of folks who were living in poverty, who had not experienced more than a high school education, and they were continuing to look at exactly that question. Perceived maternal stress during the perinatal period, and then EEG activity in two month olds. Super busy slide, tons of words. Bottom line, they confirmed those previous findings. And they started to look at some protective factors like maternal education level that could mitigate these effects. Again, if, if you can focus for one second, the key finding, I think, is that excessive early stress is associated with synapse formation and myelination. It occurs through that gene times environment interaction, and it accelerates development disrupting temporally appropriate circus-based maturation. So it's accelerating certain processes and disrupting others. 
really, really critical. So what do we do if this is happening already in two month olds? What do we do? So for the second half of this talk, I hope to share with you some optimism and some excitement about what we can do. So one solution is healthy steps, right? What is healthy steps? It is an evidence-based interdisciplinary program. We add a new team member to the primary care team. That person is a healthy steps specialist. They work right alongside the pediatric primary care provider, including family medicine primary care providers. And they are really focused on a number of different services. Why pediatrics? You guys know, I don't need to spend any time on this for you, but I, what I will focus for this crowd is that the, in the first three years, you've got 12 to 13 well-child visits. That's 12 to 13 repeated opportunities to reach families. And more than half of those visits occur in the first year of life. In this current COVID-19 epidemic, it's been very interesting to see that the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out and others have come out saying, you might want to cancel well-child visits for school-aged children and adolescent children, but do not cancel those infant and early childhood well-child visits even now, because that's how critical we think they are. So really remarkable there. We've tried to outline Healthy Steps to be a three-tiered service model. What does that mean? That means that there are some population-based activities in tier one that occur for the entire practice. So if you're a Healthy Steps practice, that means that everybody in the practice is going to receive universal screening for child concerns like autism, social emotional development, regular development, universal screening for family concerns, maternal depression, social determinants of health, and follow up on those screens. And that's everybody birth to three in a practice, not what you look like, smell like, sound like, et cetera. Tier two moves a little further up that risk stratification. These are children and families with what we like to call the lightest of pink flags, not red flags, but the earliest possible warning sign that something's not going perfectly. And for those families, we're able to offer behavior and development consults that's short-term consults on sleep, feeding, whatever it might be. They might be part of the well-child visit and you might come back a week later as well. A ton of care coordination and systems navigation, recognizing that we can't solve all the problems inside those four walls of the pediatric practice. And I'll share some really exciting new data around that with you in a bit. And then because Healthy Steps is a program of zero to three, we really benefit from zero to three's resources. And I encourage you to look at zero to three right now if you're looking for resources on how to talk to parents how to work with young children in this, in this unique time. We focus on positive parenting and early learning guidance, including literacy and STEM. And then finally, moving sort of furthest up that risk um, stratification, we have tier three. And those families are families we think are most at risk, at risk for poor development, at risk for negative um, outcomes at risk for insecure attachment and at risk for exposure to toxic stress. And for those families, they receive everything within tiers one and two and also tier three, uh, which means that we will co-manage each and every one of those 12 to 13 well child visits. So every time the family comes to see the pediatrician, they're gonna see the pediatrician and their healthy step specialist. We're just gonna go in preventively, preemptively, prospectively, whatever, what other um, sort of P, the N's and L-Y you can come up with, we're gonna go in and try to figure out exactly what's going on, focusing on that parent-child dyad and the prevention of toxic stress. These eight core components of Healthy Steps must be delivered to Fidelity within three years of implementation in order to be at Fidelity. Here are those eight core components that I just spoke about sort of listed out differently. People can go beyond that, and they do. In Arizona, all of our Healthy Steps specialists are also certified lactation consultants. In New York and DC, a lot of Healthy Steps specialists also provide parental mental health within the primary care pediatric setting. So lots of things beyond this, but you must do these. A boatload of evidence, uh, um, an initial RCT that was published in JAMA and then a two-year follow-up and then lots of site-level evidence. We try to organize the evidence into these eight categories. 
Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time in each of these. These are all available on our website in a downloadable two page um, evidence sort of frame, but I will focus on a couple of things. Families are better connected to the services they need, right? And that is really important. Again, we cannot solve all of this. If we're focused on avoiding toxic stress, we're going to do some of it within pediatrics and some of it outside of pediatrics. We know that mothers are breastfeeding longer, and we also know that there's less obesity. And that's really, really interesting. I, you say, well, hold on, you didn't say this was an obesity prevention program. No, but I would suggest to you that in early childhood, a lot of the precursors of obesity are based in that parent-child relationship. We know that with healthy steps, families are more likely to have on-time well child visits and receive the needed vaccinations. We know that's not just good for health and well-being, but that's often a quality metric that your system might be focused on. We know that there's improved parent-child relationship and improved social-emotional development, especially for children who are born to mothers who have experienced trauma in their own background. So take mothers who've experienced trauma in their own background, give half of those families healthy steps and half not healthy steps, and the ones that received the program will show better social emotional development of children at age three. We know that they're less likely to use harsh punishment. I know a lot of us are thinking about the risks to families at home right now under severe stress, and they have better knowledge of infant development more continuity of care, they're more satisfied with the practice, um, and physicians are highly satisfied. I know that we can often, as a field, sort of jump over the satisfaction data, because, oh, great, everyone likes it. You know, they won't tell you they hated it. But I do want to focus on physician burnout for a second. Um, right now, our physician colleagues are under exceeding amounts of stress. Even when there's not something like this going on, they're under pretty significant stress. They have 15 minutes in which they're supposed to conduct a well child visit that covers everything from fluoride to vaccinations to, you know, uh, bicycle helmets and everything in between. And they see what's going on for families. And nothing makes you feel less satisfied at your job than feeling like you can see a problem and you don't have the time or the training to fix it. So bring in integrated behavioral health of all sorts, and especially early childhood integrated behavioral health, the more that pediatrics is focusing on early brain development, and we really start to impact physician satisfaction. And we're looking at some data right now that's even looking at turnover of physicians based on satisfaction. Maternal depression, of course, with universal screening. I'll never forget um, one of our sites, the name shall go unmentioned, but they really were focusing using quality improvement to look at their maternal depression screening rates. They hadn't done a very good job of it. And they presented at the zero to three annual conference last year and they said, um, the joke around here is that prior to Healthy Steps bringing quality improvement to our maternal depression screening, we just didn't have depressed moms. Um, funny but not funny, suggesting that when we don't look for things, we won't find them. Early literacy, school readiness, child safety with fewer visits uh, to the ER based on injuries and even a reduced risk of SIDS based on sleeping on the back. I promised you some hot off the presses evidence that hasn't been published yet and I'm really excited to share that with you now from a couple of our sites around the country and stay tuned for this to be published. Um, our site in uh, Washington, D.C. at Children's National showed some data at the Pediatric Academic Society last year that showed that prior to Healthy Steps, they were four times more likely to get children successfully connected to early intervention Part C when kids were 18 or 19 months and two times more likely when they were younger. Four times more likely to successfully connect early intervention and we know how critical that early intervention is. Our University of Maryland Baltimore City site is a family medicine site and they're publishing a qualitative perspective where they did focus groups with uh, providers. They looked at residents and faculty physicians. They've been doing Healthy Steps for about three years and I just offer some of the quotes here. The desire to clone the Healthy Steps specialist, um, the acknowledgement that there's never a day they're not looking for their Healthy Steps specialist, and also for those of us in ped psych, I think this middle quote was really critical. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it to you if you don't mind. 
there's such a strong focus in the training of healthy steps in the biopsychosocial model. And that focus often gets overshadowed by medical needs, the disease oriented approach, but having people like the healthy step specialist, it helps them see people in the complex reality that the patient presents, not just focusing on the disease, but their social situations as well and the psychological components. I mentioned the care coordination and systems navigation work, and so I want to share with you some data that's coming out of Montefiore in the Bronx. They looked over a six-month period in 2018. They looked at 192 Healthy Steps patients who were seen in that time, and of those, 86, which is about 45%, received referrals outside the pediatric practice, a huge number. Most of them to educational services like EI, like the Children's National Work, but also the Bronx being the Bronx, housing was a really big issue, childcare, food insecurity, and domestic violence. And I think everybody knows sort of the usual data around referrals out, right? Um, the data suggests that they don't often work very well. <laughs> it's sort of like spray and pray. It's like, well, here's a number, try to call, good luck, and families don't for various reasons, having to do with stigma, having to do with fear, having to do with out-of-date phone numbers and everything in between. So in a population in the Bronx, which is really high Medicaid, um, a lot of challenges. I'm gonna show you that on this next slide, that of those referrals, over 80% were successful with another 5% still in progress. So, I don't even need to count that other 5%. Let's just call it 80%. Over 80% of these referrals were successful. Successful defined as the family actually got connected to the service and evaluated. It's pretty remarkable and really speaks to what can happen when you leverage that pediatric primary care platform to really be a linkage to the community beyond and how when it's the pediatrician him or herself trying to make those referrals, we all know it doesn't work as well. Finally, I want to show with you some longitudinal data right now uh, from the same group at Montefiore, where back in 2006, there was a control group and an intervention group enrolled, and they've been tracked longitudinally. Stay tuned for some educational data coming out next year. Uh, we finally have those data, and we are um, if, uh, looking at them right now. But here's some ED visit data, which is pretty impressive, um, that in the treatment and the control groups, you see a statistically significant difference in lifetime ED visits, emergency department visits, for these kids who now average uh, about 10 years old. All right, that was a lot of numbers, a lot of research, a lot of early childhood brain development 101 um, <laughs> to start off your morning. I want to pause for a second and I want us to focus on with all that research, with RCTs and site level findings and all of this research, almost all of it, and maybe even all of it that I presented today, is at a group level looking at mean averages and how they differ within groups, right? You got healthy steps, you didn't, and here's how you look different. But what about within each of those groups and the ways in which children differ in terms of their sensitivity to stress? And we're not able to measure that yet. That's where these biomarkers are coming in handy. We take a room of infants, and how do we decide which families get tier three services and healthy steps? Well. We do our best, right? There's ACEs screening of parents, adverse childhood experiences, there's mental health screening of parents, social determinants of health. Maybe you say any NICU baby, any baby who was low birth weight, any baby born to a teenage parent, we could give all them tier three, right? But within that group, there are going to be some children and families who don't actually need it. They are those families that are particularly resilient, or better said, those children who are particularly resilient and don't need the tier three services. And then, perhaps even more worrisome to me, we're going to have missed some families, right? Even if we do 30 screenings, we're still going to miss some families because there are children who are growing up 
in families without high ACEs scores, without parental mental health concerns, but who are exquisitely sensitive to their environment, like an orchid, and therefore really need that environment to be just right. These biomarker assays and this work of HERO is going to add this individual level assessment to our more comprehensive assessments. It's going to tell us which kids and families might be exquisitely sensitive to their environment and therefore really need our attention and our best fit of programming and interventions that work for them. And which children might be a little bit more like dandelions who are going to be able to grow in the cracks of a sidewalk and they're not so sensitive to the environment. I wish we lived in a world where we could get, give everybody tier three of Healthy Steps and or any other high quality gold standard integrated pediatric behavioral health program. Um, we don't live in that world. And so we have to get smart about our resources. And in the way that precision medicine doesn't give every cancer patient really high intensity chemotherapy, we can get smarter about our behavioral health interventions and our family interventions and not give every family with an ACEs score of seven tier three of healthy steps. I hope that's making sense to folks. Um, I will share with you um, that I grew up in Colorado. I, there are, I don't know how many counties in Colorado, over 40. And I grew up in a county called Werfano County Werfano is Spanish for orphan. And Werfano County is regularly the poorest county in Colorado. We did not have a pediatrician. I grew up without running water or electricity. I'm only 44, by the way, I turned 44, uh, what's today? I turned 44 five days ago. Uh, so this wasn't like it was in the you know 30s. Uh, it was in the 70s and 80s, like many of you. <laughs> And so on paper, I've got a bunch of adverse childhood experiences. But I have a suspicion that I might be a dandelion and I was gonna be able to make it and be able to be successful even with what was a pretty stressful early childhood experience. I wanna um, close this section with talking about just the most exquisite book I have read in a long time. It's called The Orchid and the Dandelion, Why Some Children Struggle and How All Can Thrive. It's written by Thomas Boyce, who is just a gem of a human. He's one of the scientists in the HERO Project. Um, maybe that's a conflict of interest I should have disclosed, but I get no money from this book. This is his book. Um, and he really originated this orchid dandelion hypothesis. He talks about the vast majority of kids are dandelions who can thrive in most environments. Maybe about four fifths of kids are dandelions and the remaining fifth are orchids who are more exquisite and more unusual and have potentially a higher potential than dandelions. But for this to be realized, the environment is very particular. They need careful gardening they are a delicate plant. These children, like delicate plants, if dealt with insensitively, have a greater tendency to run into problems. You guys know what it's like when someone gives you an orchid as a gift. You're like, thanks. Oh, it's stressful. You got to get it just right for that orchid. Um, Dr. Boyce in this book, the reason it's so exquisite is there's like DNA helixes in there. And then he's quoting poetry and telling you the story of his own family. He tells the story of himself and his sister. He's a dandelion. Give me a second. And she's an orchid. Um, he wasn't so susceptible to the sometimes uh, critical atmosphere of their childhood home and went on to excel. Her early promise, which by all accounts was extraordinary, was confounded by physical illness and mental illness. Um, and she killed herself when she was 53. With hindsight, he can see that he was only 
somewhat troubled by say his parents fighting where she was immobilized with fear. She was frozen. She was traumatized by it. And he talks about a more sensitive nurturing environment and how it would have allowed her to have that confidence and obvious talents uh, to blossom and her story to have had a happier outcome. We can do better as a field with this exciting new research with this potential to identify these orchids early on and to deliver the services that help them to flourish. Um, again, for all those folks out there who don't believe that this matters, this is our A1C, it's our blood pressure, and it's our ability to really get down to the individual level while still functioning at scale to reach children and families. So I will close with leaving a lot of time for questions and just let you know that here at the Healthy Steps National Office, we are really focused on this issue of scale. Um, last month, we had 166 sites across 23 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, this month, it's already up to 170. We're of course on a bit of a pause on onboarding new sites for obvious reasons, but we are really looking forward to Delaware coming on board with the Nemours group to New Jersey coming on board with the Hackensack Meridian Group, to Hawaii coming on board with the Naval Medical Center, the Department of Defense is going system-wide with Healthy Steps, and to eventually reaching a million children and families per year by 2032, focusing on those most at risk. And we are so thrilled to be partnering with the HERO Network to really bring this measurement to scale in this phase three, to reach 6,000 children and families and really understand which families and which children might benefit from the high quality services that we can all provide. So I will stop there and really open it up um, for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Briggs. Uh, this is Marissa. We have one question, so please um, send others. Uh, the first question is from Melissa Engel. And she says, as a former student of Megan Gunner, I am absolutely thrilled to see, I like your nod. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to see a focus on developmental psychobiology here at SPP. I often feel there is a gap between the fields of pediatric psychology and developmental psychology slash psychobiology. What efforts do you think pediatric psychologists could take to bridge these fields? That is a great question, Melissa. Um, and I'm sure Megan would be thrilled to, to hear you pose that question. She is um, fiery as ever and at the table. Um, for those of you who don't know Megan's early work, she was one of the earliest people to really look at the effects of attachment status and cortisol. She showed that um, children who had insecure attachments when facing fearful or strange stimuli secreted more cortisol uh, than children with secure attachments. In terms of pediatric psychology and bringing in the developmental perspective, I'm gonna be super honest with you guys. Um, I love this meeting. I love so many of the people in this meeting. And sometimes I feel like it's a meeting that's focused so much on inpatient and um, pain and diabetes. There's not a lot of developmental perspective, especially around early childhood. I think that when you focus on early childhood, you can't help but focus on development. Um, a, Two month old is profoundly different than a 12 month old. And it's such a key really piece of the focus. Um, so, you know, in the, in the, I might be, um, I might be self-serving here, <laughs> but really I would suggest a big focus on early childhood would help us to get there. And I hope that's helpful. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Crystal Sederna Mako. I'm sorry, Crystal, if I said that wrong. Um, how is Healthy Steps funded presently? What funding options exist for settings interested in participating in the future? Great question, Crystal. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, I can send you a, a two-pager that really outlines all this. I'm at rbriggs at zero to three dot org. Um, if, you know, just the good part about having a weird name like Rahil Briggs is that I'm the one that'll come up if you Google me. So feel free to find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or at email, and I'll send you this. But I will also give you an answer right now. Um, 
it's a whole variety. So on the most sustainable, we have state investment in Healthy Steps. So take Colorado as an example. Healthy Steps for a couple of years now has been on the governor's budget. Governors are uniquely situated, different than say state Medicaid authorities, to see the impact system-wide in their education system, in their juvenile justice system, their mental health system. So in Colorado, for example, we have leveraged the Healthy Steps business case, which looks at eight cost-saving interventions, dyadic in nature, five on the parent side and three on the child side, that show a year-over-year, 12-month average cost saving of over 200%. That means more or less to invest a dollar, get a little over $3 back every year within 12 months. I know sometimes we worry about being able to show cost savings in early childhood because they're so cheap, thus the look dyadically. So we leveraged that business case and those cost savings in Colorado and the state budget pays for healthy steps. We've also leveraged uh, those cost savings in other states where we are looking at value-based payment with the state Medicaid office. We have some national managed care Medicaid organizations that are particularly interested in the dyadic piece of it. They know that the parents that Healthy Steps serves are often not getting served anywhere else. These parents are not attending their own well checks. And they also know that these can be some of their most high cost parents. Um, we have lots of health system reinvestment. So that's happening in large academic medical centers, in small federally qualified health centers, health systems that are maybe started off with a philanthropic grant to get Healthy Steps up and running and then said, you know what, this, this matters, this is critical, we're gonna pay to keep this going because we see the impact on our well child visits rates that change our quality scores, on our vaccination rates, which change illness and wellness, on our physician satisfaction and et cetera. And then of course, most Healthy Steps practices, I'll be very honest, start with a grant. Sometimes those grants are more sustainable. There are federal funds like in Project Launch being used for Healthy Steps and in INC, the Integrated Care for Kids CMS grant. Uh, but again, I can send you more comprehensive information on that if you want to send me an email. Thank you. Um, several questions now. Um, Dr. Idia Thurston asks, Curious the socioeconomic diversity of these samples. Specifically, are lower incomes, such as heavily medicated and often people of color, overly sampled, oversampled, and how might this influence the story? How might results look different when adversity in all income groups are examined? So, Idia, I think you're talking, when you say these samples, I'm going to assume you're talking about the hero samples. And if not, put it in the chat box and I'll answer differently. But um, a lot of socioeconomic diversity, actually. Um, so if you're not familiar with Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, that is a more uh, upper middle class neighborhood. The Bronx, uh, there are 62 counties in New York. The Bronx ranks the poorest of all the counties. Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, also pretty significant poverty. And in Austin, Texas, a variety. As we expand it in phase three, we've been very conscious of which Healthy Step sites would be included, making sure that we have urban and rural, making sure we have diversity in terms of racial and ethnic diversity, and making sure that we have socioeconomic diversity as well. So hopefully that was helpful. Okay, Christine Durkin says, as a graduate student in West Virginia, I was unfortunately unsurprised to see it was one of the states that does not yet have Healthy Steps. We have difficulty with hiring and maintaining mental health staff in this state. Who serves as Healthy Steps provider, and how do you recommend advocating for these services in our state? Hi, Christine. I don't know if you were able to be on the advocacy um, bit yesterday, but I was struck by something he said that sort of now is your moment to do some really good advocacy around uh, some of these issues. Um, I didn't mention this, and I should have, so I apologize. When we look at scaling Healthy Steps across the country, we are in very urban areas, very rural areas. We are in all sorts of different areas. If I said, for example, out of sort of job security that Healthy Steps specialists had to be pediatric psychologists, it would be really hard to scale, not just in West Virginia, but in other places. Instead, we have outlined core competencies of Healthy Steps specialists that include early childhood mental health and early childhood development 
we strongly suggest at least a master's level provider with expertise in these two areas. The majority of Healthy Steps specialists are master's level social workers. The second most common job category is a doctoral level psychologist. And in a few places, we are working with bachelor's level community health workers and doing a significant amount of online learning support to help them get up to speed on these core competencies. So I would hope that it would not be the challenge of recruiting and retaining mental health specialists that would limit the ability to do this. Um, I would suggest that if you think you know some pediatricians with whom this would really register, go on our website. There's lots of things to download. See if it, see if it sort of sparks some interest. And uh, there are folks who have been using some of the opioid money in MOMS, which was another federal grant to focus on some of these issues and happy to speak with you further about that off, uh, offline. Thank you. We had a few questions um, based on that. And there's one that looks like a follow-up from Betty Belando. And she says, how does the Healthy Step provider differ from a child care healthy consultant? Well, uh, first and foremost, they're in primary care, not child care. So these are folks that are in primary care, but otherwise doing some similar things, right? Triaging the whole, the whole population, providing support to the pediatric providers, et cetera. So really the idea of bringing integrated behavioral health into the primary care setting rather than the child care setting. Okay, great. And just one minute left, so I'll squeeze one last question in. Might be a big one. Karen Weiss asks, for kids who have had early childhood tra trauma and toxic stress and are now struggling as teens, chronic pain, anxiety, depression, learning issues, how much potential is there for neuroplasticity or retraining neuropathways via CBT, ACT, or lifestyle change? All right, good thing I'm, I just opened the chat box so I could read that. Um, okay, early childhood trauma, toxic stress, now struggling as teens, how much potential is there for neuroplasticity? Um, Karen, I am not an expert in teenagers, but I know there are people in this meeting who are, and interestingly enough, adolescence is emerging as another moment of neuroplasticity. So even though age three is middle age when it comes to brain development, adolescence is really emerging as another window of reorganization and neuroplasticity. Um, and so absolutely a, a time where we can, where we can intervene and, and have some good outcomes. It's always going to be harder, more expensive and take longer the later we intervene. And so more important to prevent these things from happening but there are definitely experts here in adolescent psychology who can tell you much more about the fact that there is that next window that really opens up around adolescence. So thank you for that great question. We are at time. Dr. Briggs, thank you. From the response on Twitter and my own personal text messages, everyone loved it. So I will clap since no one else can. Thank you very much. Um, as we are switching from Dr. Briggs, um, Robert will be introducing Dr. Becker. And while that is happening, everybody don't forget to go to the convention session portal, sign out of this talk, sign into the next one. And um, that's it. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, everybody.